Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's Word we'll consider together this morning is taken from our epistle lesson for today. It's taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. This, then, is how you ought to regard us. As servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the, the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. This is God's word. Dear Christian friends, there are few things that are more common than opinions. There are also few things that matter less than opinions. Everyone has them, and there are many people who believe that their opinions are the most important thing on the planet, that everyone should share their opinions. And in fact, there are two classes of people. The classes, the one class of people is the class of people who agrees with me. The other class are idiots. In the church of Corinth, there were opinions that were causing problems. Because the, the church of Corinth had been served by two rather persuasive, persuasive, two rather impressive pastors. One was named Apollos, the other one was named Paul. And there was actually a division in the congregation by some who were said, no, I follow Apollos. And some said, no, I follow Paul. And others would say, well, no, I follow Jesus. So I am the best of all. And the Apostle Paul said, you're really wasting your time. You really think that your church is defined by the pastor who serves you? Do you really think that your importance is defined by the pastor to whom you have connected yourself? He said, you're looking at it all wrong. There is only one whose opinion matters. There is only one who will define you as God's family. And it's not the pastor. He says, this is how you should regard us. We do not define the congregation. We do not define how the, or what the congregation is like or how good it is. The way that you look at us it is two ways. First, servants of Christ. We're not here as leaders. We're not here as definers of truth. We're here to serve. And we're here to serve the Lord our God. And in serving the Lord our God, we will serve the congregation. But we serve the Lord first. Because I don't know how aware you are of this, but to serve a congregation is absolutely and humanly impossible. Because there's too many opinions out there. Too many opinions about what the church service should be like, about what songs it should be sung, about how fast they should be sung, about what the pastor should wear, about what his haircut should look like, about all these different things. And there are so many different opinions out there that there's no possible way that any one individual could possibly meet them all. In fact, I don't know if you remember the description of the perfect pastor. He is only 25 years old and he has 40 years of experience in the ministry. He only makes $1,200 a year, but he contributes $20,000 to the church. He wears the finest clothes because he represents the church, but he's not ostentatious. And all kinds of other contradictions. When people look at the pastor, sometimes they miss who he is. I remember when I was growing up, I 
I saw the pastor as the guy who did God's work. And I would come every week to hear about how well he did the Lord's work that week. And I was so impressed with him. And then, when I actually started listening to what he was saying, I realized that he wasn't there to do the Lord's work for me. He was there to equip me so that I could do the Lord's work. And I saw him completely differently then. Because he was a servant of Christ, but he was also one who was entrusted with the mysteries that God had revealed. There are things in Scripture that are vital for us to know. There are things in Scripture that sometimes are difficult to understand. And the Lord called that person, that pastor, to teach me what those were. And so I figured I'd better start paying attention. So I didn't miss anything. And the Apostle Paul said that that has not changed. 2,000 years ago, he said, that is how you should see your pastor. As a servant of Christ, and as one who is entrusted with the mysteries that God has been, that God has revealed, one who is delighted to tell you this is what the Lord says, to say here is what Scripture teaches. Here is the absolute truth that is so important for you to know that God went to great pains and expended great energy to write this down and to make sure that it stayed pure so that you could get it into your hands and into your mind and into your heart. That's what we do. Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must perfect it. And of course, that is the number one priority in not only a pastor, but also in a Christian. We have been given a trust. We have been given the word of life, the message of salvation. We have been given the privilege of being ambassadors in God's kingdom so that people can hear and see from us what they need to know about their Savior. Now, how do we go about that? Of course, there's a lot of different opinions about what the right way to do that is. And very rarely do they agree. You consider the apostle, or the, the, uh, the gospel lesson for today is about John the Baptist. Did he do it right? Is that how the gospel should be preached? I mean, John the Baptist was a strange man. He lived out in the desert. He had to go out there to hear. He wore camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. And he had a harsh and strident message. Is that how we need to preach the gospel? Well, compare it to how Jesus preached the gospel. Jesus' ministry was entirely different. So maybe that's the right way to do it. Of course, we have to be careful about that because if we say that everyone has to do it the way that Jesus did, then John the Baptist was wrong. And Scripture does not say that. John the Baptist is presented as a faithful, from Jesus' own evaluation, a faithful and an effective servant who carried out his task the way God wanted him to. And so he says that when the way that we carry out our trust is going to be as different as every Christian who carries it out. The way you carry out your ministry will be different from the way that I carry out mine. The gifts that God has given you are different from the gifts that God has given to me. But what is required of us is that we be faithful. That whatever gifts the Lord has given you, you use them to His glory. You use them faithfully. He said, what other people think? Well, I carry very little if I am judged by you or any human court. It is said that to serve in the ministry, you have to have the wisdom of Solomon, you have to have the patience of Job, and you have to have the hide of a rhinoceros. I 
I don't have the last one. But people say, it matters to me. And what a lot of people say, hurts. I'm striving for this, that I care, care very little about uh, if I am judged by you or in a human court. I have not yet achieved that. I recognize here that what everybody says about me matters little. But I haven't recognized that here yet. The bottom line is that only one opinion matters. And that's the opinion of our judge, who is the Lord our God, who loves us so much, He came to be our Savior, who loves us so much, He forgives us daily, who loves us so much that He accepts us as His own, not because of what we have done, but because of what He did for us. So does it really matter what everyone else thinks? It shouldn't. In fact, it says, I don't even judge myself. Because my opinion of me isn't any more important than your opinion of me. He says, my conscience is clear. That doesn't make any sense. And I think that's an important uh, point for us to recognize because there are a lot of people who say, you know what, I'm okay with God. Um, you know, I, I, I don't need this Christianity stuff as much as some people do because God and I are okay. And because they think that, does not make them innocent. Or they say, you know, I'm a fairly good person. That doesn't make them innocent either. Or I am comfortable, I am happy with the way that I am. And make a medicine either. <coughs> the important thing to remember is that it is not my opinion, nor is it the opinion of anyone else that makes them innocent. It's the opinion of Jesus Christ. He said, it is the Lord who judges me. And how will the Lord judge me? How does the Lord see you? The Lord is the one who came as Savior. The Lord is the one who died to take away all of your sins. The Lord is the one who says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And there's two important things to take away from that. The first one is that when you see yourself, you see yourself through the Lord's eyes. A forgiven child of God. Regardless of the sins that you are carrying, regardless of the history that you have, Jesus came and took away all of your sins. When he said, it is finished, that's exactly what he meant. Your sins are gone. Because Satan will try very hard to convince us that we are unworthy. Satan will try very hard to convince us that it's our opinion of ourselves that will matter on Judgment Day. Because if he can convince us of either one of those, we're going to be lost. The only one that matters is the Lord's judgment. And he came and stamped forgiven on every believer. The second thing that's important about that is that not everyone knows that. Human nature will tell us that I really define what's right and what's wrong. I define what's important and what's not. And if God happens to agree with me, then God and I are good. But if God disagrees with me, then I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to obey. I'm not going to let God tell me what to do. It's important that people know about their Savior. And God has told us that the ones He has chosen to carry that message, the one that God has chosen to invite people to meet their Savior, is us. Because not everyone knows that Jesus Christ is Lord. Not everyone knows that Jesus died to take away their sins. Not everyone knows that that is absolutely free. And He's given us the privilege of letting people know that. 
And so he says, let's not judge anything before the appointed time. And it's kind of like saying, let's not let the tide come in. Because it's human nature to judge. There are people right now in this house judging this sermon. And I'm one of them. And it's not right, but it's human nature. When we look around the Lord's house, do we judge who we see? And if we do, by what do we judge them? Because we cannot see the things that God sees. We cannot see the things that matter. We cannot see people's faith. So he says, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes and let him do it. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from the Lord. So what do we do if we're not supposed to judge? He says that we teach and we encourage and we admonish and we correct. Of course, how do you do that without judging? We don't judge the person. We don't judge their faith. But we do judge how they're carrying it out. And we encourage them to be in line with what the Lord has said. But we don't say, because you're not doing what I think, you must be wrong and less of a Christian than I. But what we do say is, can we work together more effectively? Can we glorify the Lord our God better than we are now? Can we represent our Savior more clearly? Can we seek and find the will of our God? As sinners, called by our Savior, forgiven by His blood. And judged by no one but Him. We can do that. When John the Baptist came, he got some people excited and offended others. When Jesus came, he got some people excited, offended most others. And so our ministry too. Some will listen. Some will be offended. But the Lord would have all hear what he has to say. So during this season of Advent, we think about how can we prepare ourselves and others. And it cannot be that what we will do, what we will strive to do is offend none. Because that's impossible. Some will be offended that we're doing too much. Others will be offended that we're not doing enough. What we do is how can we find the Lord's will? It doesn't matter what everyone else thinks. It matters what does the Lord do. And the Lord loves us. And the Lord forgives us. And the Lord prepares us. And just think about how blessed a message that would be. That that will be for everyone who is yet to hear from us. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now let us confess together the faith that we share in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.